clock or a schedule or a calendar here, and we just let Holy Spirit have His way. And um, it's kind of funny, I got up this morning, and well, God had a word on my heart all week long, and I thought, well, that's definitely where I'll be going on Sunday morning. Um, and then at about 12, 15 this morning, God began to put something else on my heart. So I was like, well, good. Um, it's going to be different. And, um, and then this morning, I, got to, I was praying about the service, and, and I, just, I started hearing that God said that he wanted me to go before worship. Oh, that's going to be re- really different. Um, and then kind of some others feeling similar things back there, so we're just going to let God have it. Amen? Amen. So um, just kind of let you on, in on the, the mental battle that I've had. Uh, last night we had some people over at the house, and um, we, b- before I'll go in and, and marry anybody, I always have premarital counseling with them, whether they think they need it or not. And um, so last night we had the first with Randy and Cassie, so y'all just keep them in your prayers. Um, I, I feel like God's put them together, and I feel like the, you got a good foundation. You're, you're a lot further than me and Erica was when we first got married, spiritually. So you got a good foundation, and I'm excited to see what God's doing in your life. But um, we, we, had, uh, we had some people over, and we going over some topics and, and things, and, and what I did was I went through and began to um, do some research and, and find out what the statistics were on the top things that cause problems in a marriage. And we just kind of discussed about it, and it, it went good, and we had fun, and we played some games, and, and, it, was, and it was good. And then um, late last night, I, I was laying in bed, and I was actually starting to doze in and out, and it was one of them times when Holy Spirit wakes you up, and he was like, I want you to share that with the family. Okay. Like, we'll do a marriage counseling sometime or a marriage retreat sometime and it'll be good. And we gotta he's like, No, I want you to share it with the family tomorrow. Um so then me being the, you know, the the pastor, I started trying to explain to God how Sunday morning wasn't really the time for that. And um and it just hit me all of a sudden and how and, and God said, Cody, I'm not talking about your marriage, I'm talking about our marriage. So um, if I had to title it this morning, it would be Spiritual Marriage Counseling. Um, So I started, I got up this, of course that was early morning hours this morning. Uh, So I got up around 4 o'clock this morning and and began to to look up some stuff. And how many of you ever heard the term Bride of Christ? Four of you heard that? (laughs) <laughs> so, how many of you know the, the, the phrase, Bride of Christ, is not in the King James Version Bible anywhere, or in the New King James? It doesn't say that anywhere. So, as I was doing my research, I just stumbled across some commentaries and, and some people's opinion on how they said that that was a false teaching because the King James Version does not use the words, Bride of Christ, then we have no right to consider ourselves the Bride of Christ which I disagree with 100%. And one, one thing that kind of struck me as, as funny was one guy's argument was, this was his argument. Um, I'll get in the message here in a second. But this was his argument. He said, we cannot be the bride of Christ because we are the body of Christ. And how can you be the body and the bride at the same time? And I'm sitting there thinking, that's the most simple answer I've ever, I've ever heard in my life. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So that's how you're the body and the bride at the same time. Simple answer. But um, as I sit and I was thinking about this, and and God God really began to show me some stuff on this, and uh, it may be a little more teachy than preachy this morning, um, but it'll be all right. Um, So I'm just going to read a little bit of Scripture, and then we'll, we'll dig into this. Amen? 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 All right, we're still awake. Um, I had this morning, it was a late night and an early morning this morning, so I had to go down there and get me an energy drink, and maybe I should have bought, like, a case, start distributing them out. So, uh, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Ephesians five twenty-two. 
So this will be good. We'll get, we'll get the, the boring pastor out of the way, and then we can worship together, all right? It'll be good this morning. So this is what it says. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. What's he say here? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So you see, the thing you've got to remember here is, is that if you read it in the context that it is in the, in the chapter, in what Paul is writing, he's writing all this spiritual advice throughout the chapters, and then all of a sudden he just throws in a little bit of practical advice for your marriage, and then goes back to giving spiritual advice. And that's the way I took it for years. But this is spiritual advice that he's given, and all he did was use your marriage as an example for that. Yes, this is usable. There's got to be a better word for it than usable. This is sound. This works in your marriage. It does. But he's more talking spiritual than he is physical here. So, uh, and like I said, this is going to be different, but... Praying you get something out of it. So, the number one thing that we talked about last night. Um, this was through the statistics that I found. This was the first thing that come up in things that can cause problems. It, it, actually, the title was Top Issues That Threaten a Happy Marriage. So, these are things that can threaten you, your joy. And number one was overstepping boundaries. And you can see where that would fit physically, but we're going to look at this spiritually. So listen to this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, and I'll probably go through these pretty quick. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Ephesians five eleven. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. See where we're going with this? Romans chapter 6, verse 13. How you doing back there, Bubby? Oh, he's got, he's, he's got it. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So, um, how often in the church today do you hear a message preached about sin? not often not a popular thing to preach about we're not going to we're not going to fill every blue chair in this house by preaching sin but have you know it's needed it's needed so um it's no it's no secret god set boundaries for us we have boundaries that we are not to cross we have boundaries that we are to stay within. And you see, the amazing thing about God is, is he set boundaries for us, but within their, those boundaries is complete freedom. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense naturally. You've got to think about that kingdom. Because <laughs> he sets boundaries for us, but if you stay within those boundaries, you have complete freedom. So, what is the number one thing that can hinder your marriage with Christ? Sin. Isaiah 59 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Now, how many of you know also that Romans says that for all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. So I'm not up here as the pastor telling you that you stink at life. I mean, that's not what this is because everybody messes up and everybody falls and everybody falls short. And that's one of the things that we always continually try to teach is there's no shame in stumbling. The shame is laying on the ground. There's no shame in, listen, we're going to fall, and we're going to mess up, and we're going to blow it. Why? Because we're flesh, and that's who we are. But the amazing thing is, is every time that I stumble, there's a father there with his hand out waiting to pick me back up. And you see, I have a choice in that moment. I can either lay in my sin and just refuse the hand that's reached out to me, or I can take the hand and get up out of my mess. So one of the things that can really that will always, I'm going to say always, 100% of the time, hinder your relationship with Christ is whenever we begin to allow the world to slip into our relationship. Boundaries have been set. And, and, and you've got to look at this through the right lens. You've got to look at it through the right lens. Because when God set his boundaries, He just gave me this by the piano. Okay, so you think about it. You go and you spend the money and you buy one of those underground fences for your yard, for your dog, right? And you put the collar on his neck. Why do you do that? To punish the dog and make sure it don't have any fun? Or you don't want to see the dog on the highway dead, so therefore you keep it in the yard. God's boundaries that he has set for you is not so that he can keep his thumb on top of you and make sure you don't have any fun, but it's to make sure you don't get killed on the highway. You get what I'm saying? That'll work. So, temptations arise all the time. Amen? There's always something to tempt us. Um, I, I've always loved this quote, and it, does anybody know who Rich Mullins is? Rich Mullins was a um, early 90s praise and worship singer. He wrote a lot of the songs, like the early praise and worship songs that we sing was actually written by Rich Mullins. And he has a, an amazing quote that I love, and he said this. He says, I don't want to sin, I just want to be tempted real good. He wasn't saying that bragging about it. He was saying that just trying to be honest. And he's like, you know what? I don't want to sin, but I want to get as close as I can to the line and flirt with the line. Because that's how flesh is. If we want to be honest, well, I know that that sin, so still okay here. Not over the line. And we want to flirt as close as we can with that without crossing it and think we're okay. But let me tell you something. If you flirt with the edge that much, eventually you're going to fall. You're going to fall. It's like we cannot walk through a parking lot without Haley wanting to walk on the little concrete thing and try to, you know what I mean? And what do I always tell her? You in flip-flops, girl. You fit in the fall. If you flirt with the edge for that long, eventually you're going to fall. So, God in His goodness and in His mercy and in His love, I mean, you've got to remember this. The whole time we're talking about this this morning, remember this, that God's greatest desire and greatest affection is you. His greatest desire and greatest affection is you. So, what is the greatest joy in God's life? His marriage with you. God, what, what, what else could bring God joy? A great sunset? Well, he made that. A, a, the, looking at Everest? He made that too. What about the stalk? No, he made those too. So what is the only thing that could really bring God joy? Us as his creation, giving ourselves back to him and his marriage and relationship with us. So when he sets boundaries for us, it's not him out of his wrath trying to keep us in, but it's him out of love trying to keep us close to him. So number one thing that can hinder your relationship and your marriage with God is overstepping boundaries staying within your lane leads to a happy marriage 
Amen? So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll just get real for a minute. There's very little on this earth that can make you as miserable as being feeling separation between you and the one that God has joined you to. Husbands, can I get an amen? <laughs> There's very little that can make me more miserable than to go two and three days at a time knowing that me and Erica are at, at odds. Why? Because we have literally become one flesh. So whenever you try to separate that one flesh, let's try this. I'll get my truck and Randy will get his truck and we'll hook my bumper to your right arm and his bumper to your left arm and we'll both hit the gas and see how bad that hurts to try to separate flesh. Sin causes separation and when there's a separation there, how many of you know that when, whenever Paul wrote in there, why, why did he throw that verse from Genesis into this? About the two becoming one flesh. This is spiritual, remember? So when we are... So when we are married to Jesus and we become the bride and he is the bridegroom, that means that me and Jesus are becoming... So when separation begins to come between me and him because of my sin, it's never separation between me and Jesus because of his mess up. Never. So when separation begins to come between me and Jesus for my sin, what does that do? It begins to rip apart that what has been joined together. So what does that mean? That means that it is literally impossible for you to have joy as long as you are separated from him. So how do you have a happy marriage with Yahweh? you got to keep within your lane. Easy as that. Easy as that. So if, um, if you're in one of those times where it, it feels like you just don't have the joy and you, just, and you just can't feel the happiness, maybe it's time to look in the mirror. What have I allowed in? Where have I stepped across the line that I need to come back from? And one thing that I told uh, Randy and Cassie last night, I'm going to talk about you all day. Is that okay? All right. So one thing I told them last night is I believe that there is nothing, there is no problem so big that you can't work through it in a marriage. I believe that. No problem so big you can't work through it. The same with your marriage with Jesus Christ. There is no problem so big that you and him can't take care of it. As long as you're willing because you know he's willing. As long as you're willing to take the hand that's reached out to you, there's no problem so big that it can't get worked out. Amen. So the second thing, and this is a good one, both naturally and spiritually. The second thing that can lead to an unhappy marriage is lacking complete communication. And we talked about this for a long time last night. Like everything we talked about come back around to communication. Um, Communication is different than talking. Talking and communicating are two completely different things. Talking is, I, I even wrote the definitions down, I don't want to mess this up. Talking is about giving information without the need of a response. Communication is a verbal and nonverbal exchange of information that requires a response. So, here's, here's the verses. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Oh, Bubby. Got you on that one. Proverbs 15, 8. So, it says, <laughs> score one for Cody. So, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. That's pretty cut and dry. But the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. New King James says that but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So when you communicate with him, it delights his heart. Have you ever had that feeling like, man, I don't want to pray about that. That seems so petty, and God's got better things to do 
than to listen to my petty prayer. Did you know it, you are putting joy in his heart by you talking to him? What you see as petty and repetitive and, oh my goodness, he sees as joy just to get to speak with you. Let me ask you, you can be honest with me, both of you, okay? Do you ever look at your phone and it's ringing and you see mine or Billy's name on it and you think, God, why are they calling me now? Never. Never. I can tell by the way you answer the phone, you're happy I called. Why? Because you just want to talk to me. Now, if earthly parents can have that kind of affection toward an earthly son, how much more can your heavenly father have that kind of affection toward you as his son or daughter? So whenever he looks at his sky phone... I had to throw that in. So when he looks at his phone and sees it's you on the other end of the line, he's never like, hater button. <laughs> like, like he, he, he never just, are you serious? It's his joy and it's his delight. And it is, uh, man, it's what he lives for is just to answer that call, just to hear your voice. Psalms 145, 18 and 19. Psalm 145, 18 and 19 says this. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. So, um, what's it, is it called? What's it called? Uh, log, I think it's logic. Is it, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? I'm sorry. Um, so, um, on, on Psalms 145, it says, The Lord is near to all who call him. So, if the Lord is near to all who call upon him, it stands to reason if you're not calling upon him, you're probably not near to him. Is that reasoning? Reasoning. That's pretty concrete reasoning. If the Lord is near to all who call upon him, then you're probably not near him if you're not calling upon him. Healthy communication in a marriage leads to emotional connection. Right? Lack of healthy communication in a marriage leads to emotional disconnection. Healthy communication with God leads to emotional connection with God. Seems pretty elementary, doesn't it? Lack of healthy communication with God leads to emotional disconnection with God. Pretty simple. So, I've had it asked to me before, so, I mean, like, how much should I be praying in a day? Like, how much should, how much is enough praying? And to my response is, okay, well, how much is talking to your spouse enough? I mean, like, I know better than to answer the phone when Erica calls and be like, I've done giving you my hour for the day. I know better. I, uh, I had a sixth grade teacher used to tell me all the time, I might be some dumb, but I'm not plum dumb. <laughs> like, there's some things I've gotten figured out over the last 10 years. So how much should you be, it should be constant. Me and Eric has been married almost 11 years. We've been together since I was 15 years old. I'll be 32 tomorrow. So like, that's almost half my life that I've been with Erica. And still, throughout the day while I'm at work, we text back and forth and talk. Why? Don't, don't you think in the last hundred years we've run out of stuff to talk about? Well, we talk about the same thing again, just, just to be communicating. And man, that's how it should be with God. It, you, whether you're... Two different ways of communicating with God. I think that there is times when you need that one-on-one, -on -one, quiet place, closet prayer time. And then another thing, I think it helps you throughout your day if you get that while I'm working, I'm silently in my mind just talking to him. Just like, because he cares and he wants to hear about it. Like, I, I have 20-some people under me at work and you don't know how many times throughout the day I'm like, God, they, these people are driving me crazy. 
I can't rant to anybody else. The one person I had to rant to on the floor was Randy, and they then stole him away from me to another department. So now, like, I have nobody to rant to, so I just rant to God. These people are getting on my nerves. I'm glad you love them because... <laughs> But it's okay, as long as you end it with, just bless them, Lord. Just bless them. We have to take initiative to keep the line of communication open. We have to take the initiative to keep the line of communication open. Pray quick, pray often. Something comes up, pray quick, pray often. That's one of the things we kind of talked about last night. Identify a small problem and discuss it before it becomes a big problem. So when you start feeling the problem in a spiritual coming on, pray quick, pray often. Take care of it before it blows into something huge. Amen. So the next thing we talked about and... um, Y'all just stay with me. So the next thing that we talked about on what could lead to a decline in happiness in a marriage was declining occurrences of intimacy. So what is intimacy? We've been over this several times in here. It really depends on who you ask. Because, I mean, just, just to be real, if you ask me, a man, what is intimacy, I have a very narrow view of what intimacy is. If you ask my wife what intimacy is, she's going to tell you it's holding her hand in the car while we drive. Or it's holding her on the couch while we watch MasterChef. Or it's listening to her when she talks. Am I right? That's her view of intimacy. So what is God's view of intimacy that he wants with us? I think we're giving some great examples in the New Testament. At the Last Supper... Jesus knows that this is his last time on earth. Like, he, he's got less than 24 hours on the earth, and he knows this. And he's sitting at the table. And at the time when ministry and church would tell you that you need to be out there pounding the pavement and trying to get as many saved as you can, it's your last day on earth, you need to be out there working, what's he doing? He's sitting at a table with John the Beloved rested against his bosom. And there was no place he'd rather be in that moment than right there with John. What is, what is intimacy in God's eyes? It's when Jesus is sitting at a table in the house of a Pharisee and a sinner woman comes in with an alabaster box and breaks it over his head and allows the oil to run down his head and begins to wipe the, the oil with her hair and just anointing him with tears. That's intimacy. So how, I mean, we don't have Jesus here in the flesh to pour oil on or to lay on his bosom. So so. What is our avenue of intimacy? I believe one of our greatest avenues of intimacy with the Father is through worship. I believe one of our greatest avenues of intimacy with the Father is through worship. Whether that be corporate worship here at C4, or whether that be in your house, in your bedroom, with your iPhone blaring tunes, and you dancing like nobody's watching. So... I begin to ask myself some questions in this, and and, and this is kind of what I come up with. How do we reach the next level of glory in our corporate worship? Because how many of you know that even clean water, if it sits too long, begins to get stagnant? You know what I mean? So how do we reach that next level? I believe it's when each one of us individually has our focus so much on him that even in a crowded room, we act like we're in our private worship time. That's when my worship at C4 really closely resembles my worship in my basement. Because there's times in my basement whenever I got preaching going or, or, or music going, and I can't do anything else but lay on my face and cry. And I can't dance a lick, but you better believe if those walls could talk in my basement... I've done some dancing. We're not supposed to act like that in church. (laughs) 
lack of intimacy can cause separation, division in a marriage. Lack of intimacy will definitely cause separation, division, distance between you and the Father. You see, the problem is, and the, the, I can say this with assurance because this is how I was for a very long time of my life. A majority of his church is they've said yes to the proposal and they've repeated some vows in a ceremony, but they've never consummated the marriage. I said yes to the proposal and I repeated some vows in a ceremony, but I've never allowed intimacy. And I went years like that in my walk with him. And it was about a thing that happened one time in my life that I have written on the front page of my Bible to remind me what date I got saved. And that's what it was. But Paul writes and he says, let me show you a more excellent way. You say yes to him and get betrothed to him, you can be saved and on your way to heaven. You act out marriage with him and allow it to begin intimacy, that's when you begin to reach joy unspeakable and full of glory. I feel like too many of God's people are living under his divine intention because they're happy with just wearing the ring. That makes sense? You, un you understand what? They're completely satisfied with just the label and just the title of, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I repeated a prayer when I was 14, and I'm good. But God's looking for more than just a one-time yes. God's looking for intimacy. And God established it in his word, and it still stands true. Intimacy is illegal outside of covenant. Both naturally and spiritually. Everybody got it? All right. So the next thing. Um, and like I said, I got all of these off of a, I guess it was secular, I mean, they, statistics. Um, it, it just amazed me how well they went right along with your marriage with Christ. And the next one was wondering focuses. Wondering focuses. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Matthew 6.33 But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And, and y'all knew, y'all had to have known, I had to have went to this verse. Psalm 27.4 One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, in our fast-paced world of distractions, this is much easier said than done. Would you agree with that? That keeping your focus solely on him 100% is a lot easier said than done? Um. There's always new things out there trying to draw your attention away. And it's not even always bad things. It's not always bad, sinful things. Some things can start out as good and nothing wrong with it. But whenever it begins to draw your eye off of your betrothed spouse, which is Christ, then it becomes a problem. Just like in a marriage, if, if 
my career begins to get so important to me that that's all I think about and that's all I focus on, that's all I strive towards, and I take my eyes off of my wife and I put my eyes solely on my career, that's going to cause distance between me and my wife. Well, I may achieve my career, but look at what I'm losing. And it's the same thing with him. What can cause unhappiness? What, what, can, what can make you feel unfulfilled in your marriage with him is when your focus begins to wander. And it can be, like I said, it doesn't have to be bad things. I can't count the number of times that I've seen people allow their own, oh, God help me. People allow their own children to begin to become a distraction between them and God. Or their spouse. Or their career. Or their hobbies. Or there's so many different things that it's not bad on the surface. What makes it bad is, is that now this has caught my full attention. And my marriage with him is just something I do. You gotta stay focused. That and I, I love that I love that image that God gave you that morning. And I just keep going back to that because I've always heard the, the statement that you need to have spiritual blinders on, like that like the racehorses. They put the blinders on so that they can only see one thing. Well, that's good. But God's calling us deeper and He's wanting you to put on the spiritual binoculars. I mean like really zero in, only on Him. If, if you've ever done any hunting, if you're looking through binoculars, you ain't seeing anything else. Only the one thing you're looking at. And I, I can't remember, it wasn't very long ago we talked about this. Maybe in Wednesday night. I mentioned the dove's eyes. In Song of Solomon, the shepherd king is speaking about the Shulamite, and he says, you have eyes like a dove. And a dove's eyes, the way that the dove's eyes is created they are incapable of focusing on more than one thing at a time. They have single focus. They can, only con- they can only focus their eyes on one thing at a time. So the shepherd king tells the Shulamite, I love you because you have dove's eyes and you can only focus on me. Wandering focuses. Um, we kind of talked about this last night. Technology can be a very good thing or it can be a very bad thing. There is so, there is, we as God's people have the opportunity to be entertained to death. Right? There's so many things out there meant to try to entertain you. There's, how many TV stations can you get on like Dish Network now? <laughs> two, two, and C-SPAN. Like everybody can get C-SPAN. I don't understand that at all. But like there's hundreds and thousands of TV stations out there with nothing on. And then there's radio stations. And then there's 14 million apps that you can get on your phone. And then there's all these social medias. And there's all these things that's None of them, well, some of them are, are sinful, but like some of them are not ex- sinful to begin with, but whenever that is drawing your attention away, and I, I've heard it preached recently that we're being entertained to the point that we just get numb. How, how many of you ha- have had this? You come home from a day at work that was just subpar. We'll say that. It, it was a not so good day at work. So you come home, you're tired, you're drained mentally, you're drained emotionally, you're drained physically. So you just sit on the couch, you grab the remote, and you do this. Usually this leads to me doing this. And I just get numb. Now, what would probably be more profitable to me and my bad day? Sitting there staring at MASH playing on Hulu or spending that time just trying to get some time with him? You know what, God? I'm not feeling it right now. I had a bad day, but I'm going to talk to you about it anyway. How many of you know in a marriage, sometimes you've you got to have discussions even when you don't feel like it? <laughs> Eric is back there laughing at me. 
even when you don't feel like it, sometimes you still got to just press in. In your relationship with God, listen, you're not always going to just feel like it. There's going to be seasons and times in your life whenever you feel like there's some distance in us. And sometimes it's all warm and fuzzy and kissy smoochy, and sometimes it's not. And there's going to be times when you just don't feel like it. But I believe when you press in in those times is the times you bring more joy to his heart than when you press in when it all feels good and it's all going right. The time when you take the initiative to go after him even when you don't feel like it, I believe that brings him more joy than anything. So what leads to a happy marriage with Christ? Keeping your focus on him. I only got two more. We about done. So the next one was waning appreciation. Waning appreciation. When we fail to give when we fail to give Yahweh appropriate thanksgiving, it causes us to take for granted all he's done and continues to do. I told this story last night. Me and Erica's been married ten and a half years. She still makes my plate for me when we sit down at the supper table. I've never once asked her to. Never once demanded it. Never brought it up. That's just something she does. She always has. Not because she feels like she has to. Because she enjoys it. So my job not what is nice to do. My responsibility is to show my appreciation to her for what she does. I, I can probably count on both my hands the number of times that we've eaten a meal that she cooked that I didn't thank her for it. Most always. Thank you. This is good. I appreciate it. But it goes further than just your words. You've got to show appreciation with your actions. And I shared this last night. A lot of times the way our bit schedule works usually i'm watching and entertaining both girls while she's cooking and setting the table we sit down and we eat together then me showing my appreciation to her the least i can do is clean the table off and clean the dishes right that's how i show my appreciation to her for what she does and it goes both ways and and it's the same thing with god we have to enter why does the bible say enter into his gates with thanksgiving If it gets to the point where I quit appreciating her for what she does, I'll begin to take for granted what she does. And that's a lot of what worship is. Showing our gratitude and our appreciation for everything that he's done. So I begin to just jot down some stuff for me. And this was just for me, and I'll just share it with you. You It can land wherever it lands. But... Is my standing up during worship really enough to show my appreciation for him dying for me? Is me listening to the Bible app for 10 minutes a day really enough to show my appreciation to him for everything that he's given me? Is coming to church for three hours a week really enough to show my appreciation for him allowing me to call him daddy? Do you you remember how you felt right after you got saved? Do you remember how you felt right before you got saved? That heart beating out of your chest? And like, I, I I can't walk out that door without getting this right. That just conviction and fear and longing for him that's just overwhelming you and then you get saved and he lifts all that off of you and you just have the most euphoric 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 (laughs) you have the best feeling that you've ever felt in your life and like for the next two weeks you can't tell enough people and you can't thank him enough And every time you pray, you're like, just thank you for saving me. Thank you for bringing me out of where I was and setting me up where I'm at. And then you've been saved for 15 years. How often do you still thank him for that? You see, whenever we fail to show him appreciation, we begin to take for granted. 
And I can look in my life and I can see a number of times that I took for granted that at one time I was literally on my way to hell and he reached down and grabbed me and set me up on a throne with him. Yeah. That's like the greatest transformation in history. He reaches in hell and pulls out a mess and sets me on a throne beside him to rule and reign with him. There is nothing I could ever do to show him enough appreciation. But whenever I begin to take for granted what he does, I don't show him appreciation for it. I believe that, it, man, it just come to me. We, we've said this for, for a couple years here now, that Thanksgiving is the gate to the never-ending encounter. Having an encounter with Yahweh. One of those moments when it just feels like He's all over you and you just can't get enough of Him. Thanksgiving is the gate that walks you into that. Showing Him appreciation. The last one, um, last one, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into worship or whatever Holy Spirit has for us. Um, but the last one's kind of one that we skipped over last night, and, and we'll, we'll pick it up later. But it was lacking trust. One of the things that can hurt a marriage is lacking trust. Trust is the very basis of love. Without it, a healthy marriage cannot exist. That's just basic. So, taking that spiritually, let me ask you a question. What has God ever done in the history of creation? From the time he said, let there be light, to present. What has he ever done to give you reason not to trust him? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Because I've made the statement, I'll trust you as long as you don't break that trust and give me a reason not to trust you. It was an understanding when I got my license. Dad told me, this is your curfew. And I think it was a couple years. I think by the time I turned 18, Dad said, you don't have a curfew anymore as long as you don't give me a reason not to trust you. You give me a reason not to trust you, your curfew will be 9 o'clock. You'll be in here before dark. But what has God ever done in the history of the universe to ever give us reason not to trust him? So what can cause separation between me and him and cause my joy to begin to fail in my marriage with him when I don't trust him? We talked about the storm this morning in the gate. We talked about the storm. And we, and, and we talked about, you, you know what, when the, when the sirens go off and they say there's a tornado warning and the little thing turns red on the Doppler and they see the hook echo and the inflow vortex and all that cool stuff when the storm comes, what happens? Most people go to their basement. Why? Because there's a certain level of comfort that comes when you know you're protected. Standing out in the yard, you're very susceptible to the storm. But you trust your basement. You trust your storm cellar. I don't know if you remember, but a while back, um, I, I preached a message about trust. And the, the definition that Webster's give was a, an unshaken belief was one of the definitions. And I thought, okay, unshaken, something firm, a firm belief is trust. But then you go through and you read some of the Psalms that David wrote, and he's like, Lord, why have you forgotten me? God, why is all this bad happening? And it sounds like he just goes through a whole bunch of them, and he's just whining. And I'm like, where's the trust at in that? Where, where's the trust in that? But then the Hebrew definition come to me, and it's completely different. The Hebrew definition of the word trust, like nine times out of ten, is a place, not a thing. Trust is not an action you do. Trust is a place you go. 
Most of the Hebrew definition for the word trust is a shelter, a strong tower, and a refuge. That's the Hebrew definition for trust. A shelter, a strong tower, and a refuge. One, one scripture even talks about trusting, meaning that you run in flight. That does not make any sense naturally. Me trusting means I run away. If me and Randy's fixing to fight and I'll take off running, evidently I don't trust my own abilities, right? But that is the most absolute definition of trust. Whenever you run to him. God's saying, you don't prove to me you trust me when you stand out on the battlefield by yourself swinging a sword. That does not prove to me you trust me. It proves to him that you trust him when you drop your sword and you run to him. I remember here a while back, we pulled into my driveway, and it was, it was completely dark outside. And there was, somebody had set something on the front porch that we didn't know was there. And so there's just a little bit of moonlight. Haley gets out of the truck and walks around and sees a big figure on the porch and don't know what it is. And she screams and takes off running to me. And it's all y'all's fault, because if you want to know what it was, it was those mums that somebody put on my front porch. <laughs> I know it was somebody here. Because they, they started here. But um, she's seen that, and she come, because it was just a, a figure, a shadow, a silhouette in the dark. And she ran to me, and she was like, what is that? And I'm like, it's okay, it ain't nothing, go ahead. And she's like, no. It's okay. Like, it, it's, it's literally nothing. You, you go ahead and go on in the house. No. I'm staying with you. And so I sit there within myself, well, does she not trust me? I told her it was okay. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. No, she had the utmost trust in me because she ran to me whenever the problem arose. That showed her trust that she had in me. And the same thing with him. We don't prove to him that we trust him when we go out and try to attack it on our own. We prove to him that we trust him when we put our hands up and say, it's yours, and I go stand beside him. And when the enemy says, it's okay, you can go do that, I go, "Uh uh-uh, staying with daddy. No, it's literally nothing. No, I ain't going. That's me proving I trust him. So, it hinders a marriage naturally, and it hinders your marriage spiritually with him when you lack trust. He's literally never done anything to give you reason not to trust him. And yet, how many times do we allow fear, anxiety, doubt, stress, usually over something that doesn't amount to a hill of beans? Never understood that saying. I've heard it all my life. Hill of beans. Paul wrote, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Greek word there is ecclesia, the family. He says, I'm speaking about Christ and you. All this stuff about submission and all this stuff about love, he says, I'm speaking about Christ and you. How many of you know that you, you can't have a happy marriage unless both parties are willing to submit to the other one? Christ submitted himself in death. He done his part. I don't know about you, but I consider him sitting on a throne in glory with six-winged creatures flying around his head saying, Holy, 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 and leaving that to come to earth to get spit on and to get stretched out and died. That's pretty big submission. He submitted to us. Now the ball's in our court. Am I going to submit to him? You know the only thing that's holding you back from having a perfect marriage with him? You. That's it. Me. If I want to know the number one problem in my marriage with me and him, I need to go look in the mirror and speak to him. You need to straighten up. So I'll tell you what. I asked Randy to sing a song that I don't know he's ever done. So it's going to be a little different. So, I don't know what you need this morning. 
But maybe this is a good time to show some appreciation. Maybe this is a time to, dare I say, we'll put it like this. Maybe this is some time for some PDA. Y'all remember in school, PDA, public displays of affection? Let's show some affection to our Lord. Everybody good? Nobody said they was good, so it's all you, big guy. Turn it over to you now. Come on, won't you stand with us? As they attempt this song that I sprung on them at the last moment. (laughs) All that that was said this morning all boils down to this. His greatest desire is you. He wants you more than anything else. If you need something, this altar is always open. We'd love to pray with you.